All right, welcome to another episode of the Getting to Club podcast, where you get to steal the playbooks of the top 0.01% of B2B tech sales practitioners so that you can get to club or stay at club if you're already there. And today I have two people that I've gotten to know over the last couple months. So I've got uh, Callum Kilgower and I've got John Bissett. And Callum is the founder of a company called Slingshot Edge, and I'm going to tell you more about them in just a second. And then after some time of doing this, he recruited John to come join him and be a partner in the business. John was one of Callum's customers. John, remind me what company you were working for at the time. I was working for a a small aerospace and defense contractor called Lockheed Martin. Just a tiny little a tiny company, little, some little yeah. startup, I'm sure, that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> and so now they're both running a company called Slingshot Edge, uh, which is a sales messaging and narrative consulting and training firm. And they have some of the most innovative ideas that I've seen when it comes to training mid-market enterprise and strategic sellers how to disrupt the status quo and how to kind of jar buyers, especially big enterprise buyers, uh, out of their status quo and get them to move, take get them to take what we would call gambling behavior, although maybe they're intelligent gambles if you're selling a good product, uh, and get them to actually purchase your solution. So without further ado, welcome, guys. Thank you, Chris. It's good to be here. Chris. All right. Well, you guys have a new course with us. So it's called Killing the Maybe, and it helps you do exactly what I just kind of talked about, right? Crush the maybe, kill the maybe, dismantle the status quo, do all those things. And at the beginning of the course, you guys talk about how little tweaks can lead to outsized returns and outsized success as a sales professional. And to tee us up, I would love to hear what you mean by that and maybe an example of how that shows up in the real world. Okay, well, it's absolutely true. Little tweaks can make an outsized difference. Everyone's looking for a silver bullet, if you like, in sales, and there is no silver bullet, but there's lots of little things that each one of them you could think of as a marginal gain. So on their own, not going to make much difference, but add them all up, they can make a massive difference. What is an example of a, a marginal gain? I don't know. Well, there's lots of them. You have to go through the course to get them all, but one example could be just in the language that you use when you're talking about yourself. So if someone says to you, what do you do? Maybe at a conference or on a Zoom call, the first word that typically comes out anyone's mouth is the word we or I. (laughs) And unfortunately, the word I and we instantly, typically turns off the other person's emotional mind. So a word that doesn't turn their emotional mind off but instead turns it on is the word you. Or maybe Mm -hmm. if I mention someone like you, suddenly you're going to be interested. So it's very hard to do, but if sellers could try and train themselves to stop using the word I and we and instead use the word you or other people like you before they answer such a question, they become hugely more powerful. Well, I also want to sell the audience on what these marginal gains can lead to, right? We can talk about a lot of them and using small language t- tweaks like you just mentioned is one of them. You also have a great analogy, though, at the beginning. You talk about Tiger Woods. I think I just gave a little bit of a spoiler al- alert to the analogy that you're going <laughs> to share. Uh, but tell us the Tiger Woods analogy that you tee up. Yeah, well, essentially, we, we stick up three numbers on our virtual flip chart. One of them is 9-9, nine, nine, the next one is 9-5, the next one is 4. 9-9 nine, nine really mm-hmm. is $9.9 million. That's how much Tiger Woods earned. And it's in his, in his first year of, of playing golf, not from the sponsorships and all that sort of stuff, just from playing golf. Now, the 9-5 turns into 950000 Now, if you take Tiger Tiger's competitors in the PGA circuit and take an, a typical individual's salary or the average salary of these competitors, you get 950 thousand and at this point people are going oh, what's what's this got to do with me and selling and what it's got to do with you and selling as well the last number is four percent 
This is how much Tiger mm-hmm. was better than his competition on a typical round of golf. Not very much. Typically means two or three strokes. And the reason that's important to salespeople is, well, Tiger existed in a brutally competitive environment. Sellers, particularly in the enterprise space, exist in a brutally competitive environment. To get 10 times the results from your competition, you don't have to be 10 times better. You just have to be a little bit better than everyone. Across a few different dimensions. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And that's inspiring, right? If you're uh if you translate that directly into like an enterprise selling environment, it starts to speak to the difference between those that are making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, mm-hmm. maybe two hundred thousand dollars a year, which isn't bad money, but in enterprise sales, it's not what we sign up for. Versus those that are making a million dollars or one point five million dollars or you know, heaven forbid, $2 million a year in enterprise sales, Mm -hmm. those people making multiple seven figures, they're not working 10 times harder and they're not 10 times better than you. They're just a little bit better across the skills that have a high degree of leverage. And that leads to the outsized returns that we're talking about. So one of the keys to unlocking some of these outsized returns is understanding your buyer's mind, their emotions, and their biases, and being able to sell to that. And John, I'm going to have you answer this one, but you guys talk a lot about how uh, buyers have two different kinds of minds and how you need to tweak your selling approach to be able to tap into each one of those. So tell us what you mean by that when buyers have two different types of minds, what they are, why that matters, and then maybe we can start talking about how to use that information. In terms of the two different minds that people are uh, exploring in the course, I think it's probably quite useful to prefix it with an example. There's probably a lot of myth bunking of conventional wisdom in this course. (laughs) Sellers have been taught to do things. I was taught to do things 20 years ago. That's given my age away. Um, but we were taught to do things and we're still taught to do things that really cause more harm than good, particularly when it comes to trying to overcome the status quo. So things like sell the ROI, lead with logical messages, sell the, sell the efficiency gains, the, the cost savings, the data. Benefits. The benefits. Everybody yeah, yeah. sell benefits. Sell the benefits, and the data shows, and you know this as well, Chris, from your previous company, Gong, that when you lead too early with logical messaging, you actually lose more deals. So that's quite confusing. So sell the ROI, and you're losing more deals. Um, What else? Conventional wisdom says when deals are sticking in the funnel, what do you do? Well, remind your prospect of all of the pain of the status quo and the cost of an action. That sounds like a good thing to do, but if you do that at the wrong time, you lose more deals. The secret to this is, uh, and this really gets down to the, the crux of the course, is that sellers are talking in a different language to how their prospect thinks, makes decisions, and feels value. They're talking to the logical part of the prospect's brain. So in the course, there's a deep dive into, into the mind. And the model that you look at is really this model where the, the mind is uh, delineated into two, two types of mind, an emotional mind, an emotional mm-hmm. thinking mind. And if you follow our stuff on LinkedIn, you'll know that's the chimp. So this is the chimp emotional thinker and also the logical, rational human So these two things exist in your mind at the same time. They're in constant conversation. They don't always see eye to eye. But one of the things that unfolds throughout the course is that the biggest decision maker, the chief decision maker inside your head is this emotional chimp. And when you start to understand that, you appreciate why leading with logic, logical ROI messages it doesn't really resonate with the chimp. It doesn't excite the chimp. In fact, the chimp already thinks you're a sleazy, pushy seller, unfortunately. The chimp holds that stereotype bias. So it doesn't believe the ROI, and it just it's, it's a language that the, the chimp doesn't really understand. So people watching this are probably thinking, surely ROI is important. And of course, you're not going to get a business, you know, a a deal done without the CFO seeing the business case and seeing the numbers. But I think one of the key things to get across is 
ROI is a logical justification of a decision. But the it's the emotion, it's once you know, once prospects become emotionally invested in change, that's when they look to things like ROI and business cases to justify the decision uh, intellectually, to, 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 to rationally justify it. And the problem is sellers are going in there far too early and they're not talking to the chimp. They're bypassing that chief decision maker, going straight to the logical part of the brain and trying to sell on logic. And it just, it's, you know, it doesn't work. You can see the stats, what, six in 10 deals end in no decision. Yeah, what you say about ROI reminds me of a conversation I had earlier this year with an enterprise seller, and he was frustrated. He came to me and he said, I just got told by a customer that they're going to put this project on pause for another six months or so, and I don't get it because they agreed to a $10 million ROI case, or at least a 10x ROI ROI case. The product he was selling was roughly a million dollars, and he got everybody to agree that they believed it could yield an additional $10 million in, I can't remember if it was like savings or revenue or what the deal was. Yet they still said, we're going to put this on pause for another six months. And there are a lot of reasons for that, right? One of the things that uh, all three of us talk about is he probably didn't find a big enough pain. Um, But one of the things that you guys are really good at is it sounds like he probably did not anchor the deal in such a way that speaks to dismantling the status quo and making it feel like the buyer needs to get back up to a baseline. So I actually want to talk about that one again. And and Callum, I'm going to switch over to you for a second. Uh, One of the things I absolutely love about what you guys teach is you guys don't say these words. This is my words, but you can almost manufacture urgency by using some of these sales narratives, right? Because it's great to go find something big and painful and you still have to do that, Mm -hmm. but you can also reframe the perception of your buyer status quo so that it's not them trying to move to something better. It is, oh, you're actually below what an acceptable status quo is, and we can help you get back up to that. And one of the examples, Callum, that I want to have you speak to for a second that you talk about in the course, I think it's you, Callum, it's the um, electricity bill. John, maybe it was you. If it was you, you can answer as well. But the government was trying to get people to save on their electricity bill and they hired a consultant and changed the messaging. And I want to have you guys tell that story so that people listening can hear an example of how you can switch things up in a way that gets people to act where once before they were not acting. Go for it, John. I think it was you that did that research. I think it was you in the video, but I'll, I'll happily take it, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, there, there's something, it's a, it's, a, it's a bias or a heuristic called the framing effect. And it, one of our Bibles, if you like, to the course is Danny Kahneman and his thinking fast and slow, which I, I do believe is it holds the record for being the book that has been started the most number of times but never finished. And we've. Uh, <laughs> how do people know that? Like, how the, would you? There is a league table know? of started but <laughs> never finished. We, we, we obviously in, in the you know over the last six seven years we've uh, trained a lot of sellers and we do speak to a lot of salespeople who who have claimed they, they said they've started the book but never finished it. Um, so that's the Bible for us. The work he's done on decision making psychology and you know he won a Nobel Prize for his work as well. Speaks you know volumes to what he's done. So the framing effect is really how you frame information. And it can drive different behaviour. So the example you were alluding to, Chris, was uh, I think it was the US government. They were trying to convince people to switch off televisions and unplug electrical devices when they weren't being used. They were trying to get people to save energy, to be more energy conscious. And the way they used to frame the message was as a future gain. So if you switch off your television, if you switch off lights when you're not in the room, then here's a saving. You could save $350 a year. And that worked to some extent. But then they got familiar with the likes of Richard Thaler, another Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist, and uh, Kahneman's work. And they, they sort of cottoned on to this framing effect. And the, they started to switch the message. So instead of framing it as a future gain or saving, if you take action, they said, look, 
compared to other people. So this is this is really important compared to other people. So right that's away, the status quo. Yeah. that's the yeah. status You're quo. Setting the status quo. Yeah. And this starts to set up contrast. And the chimp needs contrast to feel value. It, it, value is contrast between two two emotional states. So compared to the state status quo, you could be losing right now by not switching off these things, by not switching off these devices, your television, the lights, you could be losing $350 a year compared to other people. So right away, psychologically, what does that do? Well, it's no longer a, a, a gain, a future gain. You now feel that you are losing or in a losing position when compared to other people. And the chimp doesn't like that. It doesn't want to lose. So this is looking at the cost of inaction now. Here is the cost of inaction based on your status quo. And psychologically, what does that do? Um, it triggers something called loss aversion, which is a big theme in this course. What's loss aversion? Probably the easiest way to explain loss aversion is to think of a gamble, a flip, a flip of the coin. So at heads, you win $500. Tails, you lose $500. If you ask people, would you take that bet? The majority say no. Even though it's 50-50, equal gain, uh, comparative loss, most people want at least $1,000 back because the emotional impact of the loss, the same loss, is much, much bigger. So people are averse to the, to the potential loss and uh, would rather avoid that than pursue the potential gain. And it's the same in B2B sales, particularly enterprise selling, right? You're asking your prospects to take a gamble. And, and the bigger the, the, the purchase, the more change involved in implementing that solution, the bigger the risk. And there's no guarantees that'll pay off. And if you look at this, the, the data, if you look at large IT and software projects, something like seven in 10 don't deliver their intended outcomes. They fail to some degree. So that prospect you're trying to influence to change is thinking, hang on a second here. Yeah, I could get some of these benefits, but if this doesn't work out, that's my neck on the line. But going back to your question, yeah, using the framing effect, you can start to frame information in a particular way. Rather than framing future gains, if you can frame their current situation compared to something, some kind of benchmark or, or baseline, and show them where they're losing, that's going to drive a lot more motivation. Yeah, one of the things you guys talk about a lot is functionally, you want to get your buyers into a willingness to gamble mindset, right? And yeah. framing information to trigger this effect, this human ten tendency to want to avoid loss is one of the reasons you, or one of the ways you do that rather. There is so much we could be talking about in this conversation, but we're going to keep it to just one more thing. And I want us to start to like break down and get kind of tactical about one thing you talk or one thing you talk about toward the end of the course, which is delivering a POV, right? Delivering a, a point of view. And you guys have a four part kind of framework you can follow to delivering a point of view. Now, before I hand it over to either one of you to answer what goes into that four part framework, um, I want to kind of sell the audience on the idea behind leading with a point of view. I'm sure all of us have been in a discovery situation where we're trying to ask our problem questions and it feels like we're just kind of pulling teeth, trying to get answers out of somebody. It doesn't seem like they really want to engage. And that's not always the case, but that's often the case. And one of the many value points of delivering a POV is when you do it well, it triggers a very rich conversation, right? It almost just goes like straight to the jugular and speaks to something in your buyer that gets them to open up and have a very rich dialogue with you. Now, there's a lot more value to delivering a POV than just that, but that's, in my opinion, one of the most powerful results that you can expect when you do this well. So walk us through your four-part framework, right? I can't remember all the pieces, so I'm going to let you speak to it, but you have like Dingle, the pain, and then there's a couple other things. Tell us about that framework so that sellers have a framework that they can start using. An example, and again, it speaks to what John just spoke about, about logic versus emotion. Because actually, if you ask anyone, do you make decisions uh, logically or you're a bit of an emotional decision maker? 
everyone believes they are rational decision makers. No one's going to say, oh, I'm an emotional decision maker. But the re- reality is, <laughs> okay, you might, but the reality, <laughs> the, the reality is everyone believes all the decisions are, are, are based in absolute rationality. So one of our customers is in the space of a little bit of a boring space. So I won't mention their name. It's in the space of software asset management. So that means they sell software that helps IT managers monitor all their software licenses and make sure they've got enough software licenses and make sure that they're not going to get into trouble if they're audited. So that's what software asset management is. And most people who are selling the software will go to that IT manager and say, you should move forward with us because the evidence shows from Gartner even that if you've got this tool, this software asset management tool, you will save 10% at least on your software licenses. So that's the typical pitch that most software asset management people use. The POV per, uh, version that focuses on emotion is, hello, uh, IT manager. Other people like you are coming to us because they feel they're being treated brutally unfairly by their CFO. The CFO is saying to them, you're in charge of making sure that we don't get into trouble if we're audited. You're in charge of making sure we've got the right amount of IT, of of, uh, software licenses. And if you fail that in any way, you'll be in trouble. Yet at the same time, other members of the board are letting the business purchase their own software often without going through IT directly from SaaS vendors or downloading stuff. So IT managers are saying that they're being treated unfairly. On one hand, they've been asked to do this job, but with the other hand, their job has been made impossible. Or maybe you don't see that. So uh, typically the IT managers say, yeah, absolutely, I do see that. And suddenly their sense of fairness is triggered and they start saying, well, yeah, let, let's, let's have a deeper conversation. So the sort of fundamental differences there were logic and kind of ROI businessy type case uh, versus other people like you and emotion and little narrative. So that's the kind of, mm-hmm. that's the kind of difference. And, and I love how step by step you walk everybody through in the course on how they can create their own version of that, right? You talk about dangling pain. You talked about delivering an insight. You talk about hinting at value. And then true to what you just said, there's a little bit of a pullback where it's like, maybe that's not showing up in your yeah. world. And you kind of, if the first three steps were good and they were resonant, you're going to suck them right into having a very rich conversation with you. And so it's really powerful stuff if you can get this right. And I love how prescriptive uh, and tactical and the fact that you guys included exercise to be able to create your own like this. So really powerful stuff. We're up on time. Um couple things for everybody listening. Number one, uh, John and Callum have a course, as mentioned, called Killing the Maybe. And it's probably, at least in one way, it's probably our most impressive course because you guys did this by yourself, right? Like Matt and team over here at P-Club, like we helped out at the videos and stuff. Uh, But we are very hands-on with the majority of our course authors, And you guys kind of delivered autonomously, and it's just an incredible course. There's so much rich insight. It talks a lot about all of the theories that you guys have talked about today, but the best part is it helps salespeople bring those theories into practical applications so that you can stop losing deals to no decision and systematically dismantle the status quo. So if you're a mid-market or enterprise seller, and that resonates with you, right? You're losing deals to the status quo. You're having projects put on pause more than you would like. Go check out their course, Killing the Maybe. It's on the pclub.io website, pclub.io. And before we close out, John and Callum, tell us a little bit about Slingshot Edge and where people can learn to find more about that. Well, come to our website, uh, slingshotedge.com, mm-hmm. or perhaps uh, on a, a sort of drip feed, if you like. If you follow John right there, he publishes a little thing called that we call a chimp strip uh, every week or every two weeks. And that is a little bit like the Dilbert type 
uh, cartoon where you can easily follow a, a real sales call. Con- they're all based on real sales conversations uh, and get something from that. Typically, a, a wrong way versus a right way. Yeah, I think I think that's the, the the purpose of the chimp strip is really to try and help p- people with the how. How do you actually do this? How do you how do you execute some of these concepts in a pragmatic conversation? It's all very well giving people theory, but I think until they hear hear the good conversations, that's how that's how I learn best anyway. So it's to give that pragmatic, real world breakdown of some of these techniques in a sales conversation. Right. Well, go check out the Chimp Strips and John and Callum. Thanks for joining today. Thank you, Chris. Cheers, Chris. Cheers. Pleasure. Thank you.